Greetings, poetry lovers. It's uh, time for us to do another walkthrough of a poem, and this week uh, we'll be dealing with Percy Shelley, uh, who is on the Mount Rushmore of English Romantic Poets. Um, so let's um, take our hand to Ozymandias. Uh, just by way of background, uh, before I read it, um, this um, uh, this poem, critics believe, was inspired by a, uh, an enormous statue of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II. Uh, he's also known as Ramses the Great and, of course, known as Ozymandias. Uh, so this was purchased for the British Museum by uh, an Italian explorer named Giovanni Belzoni. And uh, so this poem was, uh, was written in late 1817 or so uh, as part of a competition between Shelley and his friend Horace Smith. Uh, the poem then was published in the Examiner in January of 1818. Uh, so let's read it. Uh, on the website, by the way, there's a, a marvelous reading by a, um, a British gentleman who has uh, great uh, gravitas uh, in his voice. Uh, I'll see what I can do here to uh, to stay with him. So if you want to listen to that one, you can uh, you can download the audio on the topics page for uh, this week. That is the week of. Uh, April 6th, Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Okay, so the um, the poem, as you can tell by its just uh, compact form, you, you have to be asking yourself, is this a, is this a sonnet? And of course, we count lines. It is a uh, 14-line poem, and it's a sonnet, though an irregular one, as we will see from the uncharacteristic rhyme scheme and the powerfully uh, irregular meter. Uh, now, the power of the poem derives from the, the profusion of stressed syllables, an intense compression of sound, uh, the cacophonous T's and K's and long vowel sounds are interspersed with a steady stream of sibilance. Uh, you know, sibilance to be S sounds. Uh, expect that as a question on the quiz. Uh, so now the evocative visual image then of the ruined statue in a tumbled heap out in the vast desert brings to the fore the, the irony of the dead king's proud boast, look on my works ye mighty and despair. Of course, all that can be seen around the pedestal upon which the uh, sort of hubristic declaration is written is sand and sky sweeping to the horizon in all directions. And the mighty who read these words may indeed despair not at the power of Ozymandias, but at the recognition that what power they wield themselves will crumble from statue to stone to sand. So let's take a look here at, um, you can see that I've already done a bit of, um, of the scansion, actually all the scansion, and uh, I should say at this point that uh, today's analysis is brought to you by Swiss made Caran d'Ache pencil. It says HB so it's a uh, uh, it's what we in, in America call the number two. Uh, nice pencil um, and here in, uh, in sort of a fuchsia and purple or purple-ish lavender. Okay so let's take a look then. Uh, I, I'm going to, um, uh, to bring forward a concept that we have discussed uh, in recent weeks namely the medial stress uh, I think a poem like this uh, lends itself well for me to uh, uh, to bring that idea to the fore. So, um, 
if you look at the at the poem just from a uh, from a high level, you might say, okay, well, it's largely iambic pentameter, but I think it's more nuanced than that. So if you read it as as a, a straight up iambic pentameter series of lines, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, "To vast and trunkless lakes of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand." It, it, you can see that it just doesn't read that way. Okay. So what I've done is is um, is given emphasis as you should to the uh, the words as they are used in context. Okay. And you can tell. Um, that there are there are three speakers that are present in the poem. Uh, the first, who who states, "I met a traveler from an antique land who said," and now he's quoting for the rest of the poem. Uh, so we'll say that this is. Um, let's see. Let me move this out a little bit. Uh, this is the main speaker. Uh, this is the speaker who uh, Shelley presents uh, for us. And then from here, inside the quotation marks, all the way down, this is the traveler. All right, so this is the traveler. And then within the bracket is Ozymandias. So you have our speaker quoting the traveler, quoting Ozymandias. Um, the effect of this, by the way, is that um, it, it shows you how far removed um, and how, um, how distant the words of Ozymandias seem to us to be. And so if, if you'll, we're going to look at some of the images in, in a bit, but uh, you'll note that there, there's a good deal of contrast uh, that makes an appearance. And I think that um, the, the way that the, uh, that the meter runs and so on, there, there's a good deal of discord in the poem, again, probably as a um, as an effort toward uh, toward demonstrating uh, sort of the irony that I pointed up earlier about uh, about Ozymandias' words uh, and how little sway they hold, especially when you are when you have the visual image of the uh, of the wrecked statue in stark contrast to the uh, to the vast expanse of sand and sky. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, at the rhyme scheme real quick and. Um, so what we've got here is it starts out uh, looking a little bit like an English sonnet here with the the A, the B, the A, land, stone, sand, and then frown is going to be a uh, slant rhyme off of stone. And then we're going to see that command, okay, rhymes with our first line, so we're going to give that an A. But here's where things start to get um, uh, to get all crazy. So we go... A C D C okay with red things and fed up here then is going to give us uh, an E line E and then it goes to D up here kings which rhymes back with things and despair then is going to be a slant a near rhyme to appear, so despair, decay, entirely new rhyme here, and then bear, of course, rhymes back with the slant E line, and then away matches up with decay. Now, I'm, I'm going to point this out at the end, um, how away, it has duration uh, as a syllable, now the second syllable in away, uh, just as it as it matches the uh, the visual that you have of the sand stretching um, off into the distance. Okay, so if we take a look at the uh, at the beats here. You can see how and and I think that if you need to stop the uh, the recording and go ahead and and mark this poem exactly as I have it marked. So I've got medial stress, strong stress, unstressed, stressed, medial, medial, unstressed, stress, stress, stressed. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, okay, I mean, the, this is the power verb here, said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. All right, so 
you, you'll notice that each of these lines ends with a stressed syllable. Uh, this is indicative of course of rising meter. So you want to make a, a note of that uh, somewhere. And <clears throat> then you have a number of either medial or full stressed syllables that begin. So uh, you, this profusion of stresses that you've got is, is supposed to be evocative of the idea of command. But uh, as I said a moment ago, it's the, it's the irony of, of the power that Ozymandias assumes that he has and will always have, that if he has, um, you know, the Egyptians, of course, believed in the afterlife, and they erected uh, huge... Uh, monuments to themselves in the form of the pyramids and stone statues and, and all this kind of thing. And, and as I said before, the, uh, the statue of Ramses II that appeared in, the, in the, uh, the British Museum. If you ever get a chance to go to London, of course, you really need to see the British Museum. It's just absolutely marvelous. Um, so let me point out a couple things uh, about the poem as we, as we push forward. Okay, so... <clears throat> You want to go in and, and mark, as I said in the uh, introduction, the, the the hard syllables that are stretched. I mean, you have the I uh, as the as the the, the stressed uh, vowels. Lots of T's. Uh, two vast trunkless legs. Stone uh, again interspersed with the with all the S's. If you were to, to to circle them, and I have not. I mean, you're talking about dozens of S sounds uh, that make an appearance. Okay, now. Uh, you've got a good deal of, uh, of visual imagery, okay, with the uh, with the half-sunk, shattered visage uh, and so forth that lies. Um, there's there's all kinds of emphasis on the look on the face of the um, you know the, the the king that's supposed to be memorialized, the dead king. Um, so the the sneer, wrinkled lip sneer of cold command. Look at those um, hard K sounds in cold and command. Tell that it's sculptor well those passions read which yet survive. So <clears throat> of the, uh, it, it should be striking to us that, that of the statue that survives, we can look at the face and we can see uh, some of those elements that, uh, that the sculptor wanted to, um, uh, to make sure were captured then in his work. So it, it should also be clear that this is the way that Ozymandias wanted us to see him, not as a, um, you know, as a beneficent king, um, you know, really maybe not even as a, uh, as a warrior king, but look at his works, all right, the things that perhaps he accomplished. Um, and so you're supposed to be uh, awed, uh, and even more than awed, it's so awesome that you are sunk into despair if you are mighty because you you instantly are able to see I can't accomplish anything like that why am I even bothering okay now let's take a look we got some figurative language in here okay so uh, we're gonna circle hand and we know the hand that mocked them so uh, the hand then of course the hand of the sculpture uh, is synecdoche yep and the heart that fed once again, got synecdoche, right? So let's see, and on the pedestal these words appear. All right, so there's really not, uh, other than, uh, than the hand and the heart, uh, the hand sort of standing in for, uh, for the works, the things that, um, uh, that Ozymandias did as a ruler, uh, and, and we're supposed to understand here that the heart um, that fed, okay, were his passions, and his passions obviously centered on um, on achievement, on the things that he did, and leaving them behind. You know, we talk about um, uh, athletes and their legacy, um, but for athletes, their legacies generally are uh, are what are records uh, that they have set. Uh, how many MVP? Uh, awards did they win? How many championships? Um, you know, uh, what, what were their uh, point scoring totals, assists, rebounds? How many triple doubles and all this kind of business? Okay, but these aren't the tangible things that that Osmandius is talking about. But like I said, it's um, it's ironic because 
um, although there's uh, something that survives of what he did, this this uh, this uh, monument to himself, it's crumpled, and and as you know, stone over time is ultimately going to wear away and become granular like sand, and this is uh, of course the point that um, then that Shelley is making. All right, so. I think that of the of the features that uh, that are worth looking at here, uh, a great deal of uh, of acoustic power. Uh, if you if you walk yourself through the poem and and you'll see just how much um, how much alliteration there is. And and, and let me go ahead and point your uh, turn your attention to here the lone, listen that 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 long O the O and level. And now here we have the sibilance of the S's sands stretch far away and then that last um, that last syllable that has has such duration that uh, that sort of echoes off into the uh, into the distance all right so uh, that's what I have to say about this particular poem and um, happy studying for the quiz